take your Bible and turn to the book of John, John chapter 7. If you are a guest here, uh, we are preaching verse by verse through the gospel of John. As I have it mapped out, Lord willing, we will complete the gospel of John in December of 2023. So we're about, oh, a third of the way through. And here we are in chapter 7 of John's gospel. And I'm going to be preaching a message I've entitled, Are You Thirsty? Are You Thirsty? Well, about 25 years ago, an interesting fad began to develop in pop culture. And like most fads, it showed up on the scene and was everywhere, ubiquitous. And then it started to fade away. But you could still see these things around from time to time. And the fad I'm talking about is something that I think just about everybody had one, and that was one of these 3D posters. You may have, I've got a picture of a 3D poster, one of those nondescript, colorful images that were computer generated that you look at and it looks like a nothingness of random shapes and colors and squiggles and lines and what does this even mean? But then as you learned, you could kind of get your eyes to focus or more better out of focus and all of a sudden as your eyes begin to come out of focus this 3d image would begin to come off of that nondescript picture does anybody remember these things yeah sure people looked at them all the time and some people were able to look at them and kind of see the 3d image pop up really well And I was one of those, actually. I could take my glasses off and look at it. I guess because it was already out of focus because I took my glasses off, that image just started to pop off the screen, off the page. And there were other people that they could look at it for seemingly hours, and they could never uh, figure out what it was that was popping off. And then after several hours, they become more as they stare, and they stare, and they stare, become more and more frustrated, kind of like Mr. Pitt. I don't know if you know who Mr. Pitt is, but I've got an image of Mr. Pitt trying to find the 3D image. (laughs) I remember one time at my parents' house, um, my mom had one of these posters in her lap, and she was sitting there for what seemed like hours, and eventually she thought all of her children were playing an elaborate prank on her that there was actually no 3D image. We're like, no, Mom, we would never do that. Well, we would do that, but we weren't doing that. And she just couldn't see it. Some people could see them, some people couldn't. There, there is something of a trick to these images. You have to adjust your focus just right so that the image will pop out. And then once you do, that 3D image appears if you have your eyes focused just right. You can see clearly this 3D image the corners and the depth and the nuance of this three-dimensional image if you know how to use your eyes properly. And this is really a great metaphor for studying the Bible, particularly as we try to see the image of Jesus as he pops off the pages of the Bible, particularly as we seek to understand the Old Testament and how it is fulfilled in the New Testament as well. Again, that's what we're trying to see in my message this morning, are you thirsty? Different folks can be staring at the same text, at the same passage, and some can see what's there, and others are like, I don't get it, I don't see it. So my prayer has been, particularly this week, that the Holy Spirit, who we just sang, would enter this place, would fill this place, would fill the atmosphere. My prayer this week has been that the Holy Spirit would give us unique focus to be able to see Jesus as he pops off the page. Now, today's date is October 16th, 2022. It just so happens that on the Jewish calendar today, it is the final day, the last day of the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, or as it's commonly called today, Sukkot, which is uh, just the Hebrew word for tent or booth. Today, October 16th, is the last day of that feast on the Jewish calendar. And it just so happens, coincidentally, by chance, the text we're going to read today begins by saying, on the last day of the feast, it happens to be the Feast of Booze. What are the chances? I didn't plan this ahead of time. This just happens to be by the providence of God. We're going to look at Jesus stand up in this crowded, cram-packed temple, and John tells us it is the last day of Sukkot. It's the last day of the Feast of Booze, and he says something that is profound, something that is incredible. Well, let's read the passage. It's only three verses. This is the inspired and errant word of God. Here's God's word. 
on the last day of the feast, this would be the Feast of Booths or Sukkot, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So again, John says that Jesus stands up on the last day of the feast, the great day of the feast, and he cries out in a loud voice. And what Jesus is doing here in these verses is he is appropriating this high and holy Jewish festival, and he's saying, this is all, everything you've been doing for these last eight days, all the booths and the tabernacles that you've put up, all the festivities you've participated in in the temple, the water libation that's been happening day after day, all these things are pointing to me. Now, that doesn't really catch us with the jarring shock it would have caught those first hearers there in the first century because we're used to hearing Jesus say things about himself that are quite incredible, bold claims. But what he's doing here would be akin to if I did something like this. Next month in November, the end of the month, the 20th, on a Sunday evening, it is our probably my favorite church tradition we have. It's our annual Thanksgiving church-wide dinner where everybody brings uh, their favorite Thanksgiving dish, their favorite Thanksgiving dessert, and we have this huge potluck. We, we cram-pack our fellowship hall with several hundred people, and we just enjoy and offer our thanksgiving for all that God's done for us. It would be like if at the middle of that Thanksgiving feast, and we're all packed together, that I went on the stage and grabbed a microphone, and I said, I'm so glad you all came here to give thanks to me, to offer your thanksgiving for what a great person I am. In fact, I don't know if you know this, but the Thanksgiving holiday, not just here, but worldwide, it's for me. And everyone exists to give thanks to me. Now, if you thought I wasn't joking and I was being serious, I hope you would come and grab the microphone and haul me away to get my mental capacity checked because that would be the right thing and justifiable thing to do. This is what Jesus is doing here. He's standing among these people and he's taking what is the most populated Jewish festival and he's saying to other human beings, this whole festival, it's all about me. This whole feast is directed towards me, and that's exactly what he's doing. It Again, it may not be clear upon f- the first reading of those three verses, but hopefully as we go through the passage today, this 3D image of Jesus will begin to come off the page and we'll be able to see it clearly. What Jesus does is he portrays some fantastic truths about the Feast of Booths and particularly how he is the fulfillment of them. There's really three things, one from the past, one from the present, and one for the future that I want us to see. The first thing is this. Number one, I want us to consider the imagery from the past. The imagery from the past. Verse 38 says that this, again, is a fulfillment of Old Testament, Jesus says, of the Old Testament scriptures. Look at verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, it's likely that Jesus is not pointing to one particular verse, but he's pointing to a whole constellation of passages from the Old Testament that taken in their entirety are pointing to this reality, that Jesus, as the Messiah, is the fulfillment of all these promises of rivers of living water flowing out of the innermost being of a human. Uh, If you go back and look in the Old Testament, in the, the Torah, the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, lists for us the various feasts that the Jewish people would celebrate through their calendar, through their annual uh, pilgrimage, through their calendar. And so I want to ask you to turn to Leviticus 23, but I've got on the next slide all the different feasts that were part of the Jewish festivals, their calendar. It began in the spring with the Feast of Passover, Leviticus 23, 4 through 8. Then following that would be the Feast of first fruits. After that, the Feast of Weeks, or in Greek, it's called Pentecost, and we've heard of that. Next, following that, would be the Feast of Trumpets. Following that, the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. 
And then finally, the last festival of their annual calendar was this Feast of Booths or Feast of Tabernacles. You may notice there the lengthiest description of all these holidays is the final one, the Feast of Booths. It's the most elaborate, and it's the one that really wrapped up their entire calendar of holidays and festivities. This was an eight-day-long feast. It began on a Sunday, and it ended on a Sunday. Again, the Jews today are ending their festival of booths today. What this means is is that because part of the Feast of Booths was them setting up tents and uh, putting up booths and tabernacles for them to dwell in for this eight-day camping trip, because it started on a Sunday, they wouldn't be breaking any Sabbath rituals of working on the Sabbath on Saturday. Because it ended on Sunday when they took their booths down, they weren't breaking any Sabbath rituals about working on the Sabbath. So it started on Sunday, and it ended on Sunday. And it's on this eighth day, this final day of the feast, on Sunday, don't miss that, that Jesus makes this promise and this prediction of the coming and filling of the Holy Spirit. This is powerful. On Sunday, Jesus said, you're going to be filled with the Spirit. Not only that, if you go back to the beginning, the top of the rotation, you go to the feast of the Passover, which would happen six months from this moment. And I've told you in previous sermons, six months from this feast of booths, Jesus would be crucified, killed, and buried in a tomb during the feast of Passover. But watch this. On the eighth day of Passover, which happens to be a Sunday, Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Isn't that awesome? (laughs) That he gives the promise of the coming Holy Spirit on a Sunday. He's resurrected from the dead on a Sunday, but it doesn't stop there. Because as you move forward to the next pilgrimage festival, which is not the Feast of First Fruits, but the Feast of Weeks or Pentecost, this would also be a large gathering of people, of pilgrims, into Jerusalem. And on the Sunday, at the end of Pentecost, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit comes down on the church gathered in the upper room. The very promise that Jesus had made uh, seven months earlier that he would send the Holy Spirit, on Sunday he made the promise. On Sunday he was resurrected by the power of that same Spirit at the end of Passover. And then the final Sunday of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down empowering the church. This is why we worship on Sundays. We are not people of the Sabbath. We are people of the first day of the week. We are the people of the Sunday because Jesus planted and established and inaugurated his church on the first day of the week. We worship him on that day. Now, performed during this Feast of Tabernacles was a ritual known as the water libation ceremony. The water libation ceremony, and this is essentially how this ceremony would work, again, for eight days during the Feast of Booths, is that a priest would go down to the Pool of Siloam. You've probably heard of that pool. It's where Jesus healed an invalid. A priest with many other priests and other pilgrims would go, and they'd have trumpets, shofars, you know, these horns that they call shofars, shofar, show good. They would, sorry, you have to do that joke every time you say shofar from the pulpit, Um, shofars, and they would blow this trumpet, and they would celebrate, and they would dip this golden jar down into the pool of Siloam, and they would carry that water, some 15-minute walk, up to the temple. And every day as they came into their, through the, what's called the water gate. They would arrive through the water gate with, again, more trumpet blasts, and people would be celebrating, and the priests would march around the altar. And as they march around the altar, they would be singing praise psalms. They would be singing the Hallel, which is Psalms 113 through 118. And these worshipers would have, in one hand, they would have a branch, and they would be waving this branch. And all these people, on the other hand, they would have a piece of fruit. And as this uh, priest got up around the altar, they would all be singing, and then they would shout three times, give thanks to the Lord. After that third shout, trumpets blasting, singing the Hallels, shouting give thanks to the Lord, there would be complete silence. And they would all watch as the priest lifted up the golden jar, and he began to pour water out all around the altar. And this water libation ceremony 
happened every day. Now, this ceremony recalled several things. One, past, present, future. In the past, it was looking back at the Exodus experience, how God supernaturally provided water from the rock for them to drink. And so they were thanking God for his supernatural provision in the past. This water libation ceremony also celebrated God in the present as they're holding up the citrus fruit. This was a celebration of the harvest. Thank you, God, for the harvest and also something of a petition of prayer. Would you send rain? Because without rain, you don't get citrus fruit. Would you send rain so that we can have an, another harvest next year? But then it was also looking forward to the future. As they look forward to the future, they would look in anticipation of the age of the Messiah, when the Messiah would reign in this future age. And they would recall and they would recite from Isaiah chapter 12. Look at Isaiah 12, 1 through 3. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So this Feast of Tabernacles really became connected with the imagery of water and all that water portrayed. And again, this ceremony would happen every day for eight days as they would pour this water out, complete silence. Now, the last day, the eighth day, there was a little twist on the ceremony. That water that's in that golden jar, they would actually mix a little wine with that water. And then as the priest would lift it up after the three shouts of give thanks to Yahweh, give thanks to God, complete silence, then the priest would pour that mixed water and wine not around the altar, but he would pour it on the altar. And scholars think it is at that very moment of silence on the eighth day that Jesus stood up and he shouted in a loud voice. This is fantastic. In fact, notice again uh, verse, the end of verse 37. The silence is broken. In verse 37 it says, On the last day of the great feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. Last week we considered this word cried out. If you were here last week, I'll, I'll remind you in case you forgot, this Greek word there is only used four times in the New Testament to describe Jesus' tone of voice. It, it literally means to yell at the top of your lungs, to cry out. We considered it last week. It's here. It is again this week. Uh, we'll see it again when we get to John chapter 12 sometime next year. And then this word is also used of Jesus when he's on the cross in Matthew 27. Jesus is on the cross, and he cried out with a loud voice before bowing in his head and dying. But here's Jesus on this great day of the feast. He cries out in a loud voice, shouting at the top of his lungs, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. There was no mistaking from any of the tens of thousands of people crammed into the temple courts that day exactly what Jesus was saying. He was appropriating the Jewish festivals and the Jewish feasts and the imagery of this water libation ceremony. He was saying it all refers and points to me. That's the imagery of of this festival we see from the past. But here's the second thing I want you to notice. Number two, the invitation for the present. The invitation for the present. He gives a present inv invitation to the people gathered there as he makes this loud proclamation in the midst of the silence of that ceremony. What's the invitation again? If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. I could spend a whole sermon or a whole series of sermons on this one sentence. But I want to break it down real quickly. First thing I want us to notice about this invitation is the word anyone. And what that tells us is it's available to all. Anyone. Anyone. And think about who that includes here. It includes, obviously, the Jewish pilgrims from all over the region. 
It includes, obviously, the, the officers, the court officers that were sent by the Sanhedrin to go and arrest Jesus so they could put him in jail and eventually kill him. They're anyone's. It includes the very enemies, the religious rulers that want to see him dead. He says, if anyone, and friend, it includes you too, anyone, if there is anyone who thirsts, let him come to me and drink. How often has the Lord stretched out his hands to you and said, would you come? Anyone, would you come and drink? And now let's think about that next word, the word thirst. What is thirst? What does it mean to, to thirst? What does it mean to be thirsty? Well, thirst is obviously a human appetite, right? We've all probably been thirsty before. There are times that we're probably dehydrated. We've gone through a, maybe a vigorous workout. Those of us that have wrestled, we know what it means to cut weight, and we spend a couple of days uh, dehydrating ourselves and getting rid of water weight. And then after the weigh-in, we are very, very thirsty. What do we do? We go take a drink, right? We're thirsty. And so he uses this common, understandable, particularly in that era and that time, in an arid location, a lot of desert, they knew what it meant to be thirsty. But he's not talking about physical thirst here. He's saying that there's a thirst of the soul. There's an inner desire, an inner craving. When we get physically thirsty, we go to the water bottle. But where do you go when your soul gets thirsty? Where do you go to seek to find the satisfaction for that thirst? Well, that leads to the next thing. The, the phrase that he says is, come to me. Come to me. Your body was made to live on water, but friend, your soul was made to live on God. And how many other liquids, philosophies, ideas, pursuits do we go to to try to satisfy that thirsting of our soul? It's like the man who's adrift on the lifeboat in the middle of the ocean. That water, that salt water, looks like it will satisfy his thirst. But what happens if he drinks it? He only becomes more dehydrated because of the salt content. There are things in this world that look like this will really satisfy. If I just drink deeply of this, it will satisfy that nagging need, that deep want, that incredible craving. Jesus says, come to me. Jesus is the soul-satisfying water we all need. Nothing satisfies like Jesus. You know, Jesus said something similar in John 6. If you remember, we were there several weeks ago. In the very first I am statement that Jesus made in the book of John, as recorded in John, we find this recorded in his gospel account. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. So Jesus was saying he doesn't just provide bread. He says, I am the bread. He's not saying, I can give you water to satisfy your soul. He's saying, I am the water that satisfies your soul. There's so many people, souls created by God to be satisfied in God, who are plodding along, trying to discover their purpose, trying to figure out their why. What, what am I here for? This is your purpose, to have your soul satisfied by God. That's why you were created. If anyone, it's an invitation open to all, is thirsty, this strong desire, this great sensation of need, he says, let him come to me, the living water that is Jesus, the person, not an organization, not a philosophy. But then the last word of the invitation, he says, drink. Drink. Well, what is meant by this word, Drink. Well, when I preached this several weeks ago, and we looked at John 6.35, I, the title of my sermon then was, Eating is Believing. Eating is Believing, and that's exactly what it is. But eating is metaphorical for faith, and the same is true here. Drinking 
is believing. That's what the word drink means. In fact, look at John 6, 35 again. It says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Belief is drinking. It's drinking. And then back to our focal text. The invitation is laid out in verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Watch verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So I don't want us to miss this. It sounds simple, but it's profound. Drinking of Jesus is believing in him. Believing in Jesus is portrayed as drinking to have the satisfaction of of your soul that only he can give. Here's why I want us to consider this and ponder this for a moment. Because we live in, a, in an era of church history when there's been something of a misnomer about what it means to believe in Jesus. There's been this misnomer over the last couple of generations of Christians that believing in Jesus is simply this, making a decision. I've made a decision for Jesus. Missionaries and evangelists, they have this kind of ideal. We need to go make decisions for Christ. We're going to foreign countries to get decisions. I get brochures from evangelists, and the cover of the brochure says, last month, 42 decisions for Christ. Is believing in Jesus simply decisional? We just say, decide one day. Okay, (laughs) I've decided. I think that terminology, though it's somewhat true, it undercuts the deep meaning of what saving faith really is. And it may be why we have many professing Christians who are not possessing Christians. Because according to Jesus, believing is when you are starving You are hungry, and you come to Christ alone to have that deep ache satisfied. Believing is not just a decision. I check a box. Okay, I've done it. I'm good. Believing in Jesus is drinking to have that dehydration filled. True belief is finding satisfaction in Christ alone. And you may be here this morning, and you made a decision. You agreed to a set of facts, but you never said, Jesus, in you and you alone, I want to find my full satisfaction. If that's you today, be satisfied in Christ. Come to him and say, I want to be satisfied and drink deeply, not of an idea, not of a presentation, but of Jesus. Drink of him. Are you thirsty? Do you need a drink? Has your soul been satisfied by Christ and his work of a perfect life and substitutionary death and glorious resurrection from the dead? That leads to the third truth I want us to see from this passage. Not only the imagery of Jesus we see from the past in the Old Testament scriptures, the invitation of Jesus in the present to come and drink deeply But thirdly, the implication for the future. The implication for the future. For those who respond to the invitation to come and drink deeply of Jesus, what's the implication for us? What does Jesus say is going to happen? What's the promise? Look again at the end of verse 38 and then to verse 39. Out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Of the four gospel accounts we have in our Bibles, John is the most theological. And here he lets us know through this commentary of verse 39. He tells us, here's what Jesus was talking about. When he made this promise, out of your heart will flow rivers of living water, here's what he meant. And it's good that he does that for us. We find a similar thing in John chapter 2. Jesus said in John 2, destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. What did everybody think he was talking about? The physical temple there in Jerusalem. 
But after his resurrection from the dead, as he's further teaching his disciples, they were like, oh, now it makes sense. This is what you meant by that saying three years ago, that when your body, the temple of God, is destroyed, you'll raise it up again in three days. So John gives us some commentary in chapter 2. He gives us some commentary here in chapter 7. What he's saying is that after Jesus' resurrection from the dead, the ascension into heaven, and as he told his followers, you wait In Jerusalem for me, and I will send the Holy Spirit into your lives. This is what he was talking about. This is the implication for the future he was giving. And Jesus describes this indwelling and empowering manifestation of the Spirit upon the church with these words, rivers of living water. Rivers of living water. Not just a river, not just a spring, plural. Rivers. When the Spirit comes upon the church, there will be rivers. Rivers of living water flowing from his people. As I contemplated that promise from Jesus this week, I thought, what is he talking about? What are the rivers of living water that Jesus will give to his church through the power of the Holy Spirit indwelling his people. Well, I've got four rivers that I came up with. There are certainly more rivers that the Spirit produces in the life of his church, but these are four for sure that I know Jesus was talking about. Consider these with me. The first one I want us to think about is this river from the Spirit, the river of power. The river of of power. In Romans 8, 11, Paul says, if the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. What is this? It's a river of power. It's a river of resurrection power. It's a river that empowers you to face the difficulties and the hardships and the afflictions of this life and live in Holy Spirit resurrection power. What a gift. We see that the Holy Spirit is power all through the Bible. In the Old Testament is the Holy Spirit who powerfully hovered over creation. We see the Holy Spirit come upon some of the Old Testament saints like Samson, like David, like Joshua with power to minister, to serve, for warfare. And Jesus even makes this promise to his disciples before he ascended about the coming power of the Holy Spirit. Look at Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And on top of that, Not only the power that is resurrection power to give us spiritual life, power that gives us the capacity to be his witnesses in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and to the ends of the earth, he also manifests his power in us through the distribution of supernatural spiritual gifts. These power us for ministry and service in his church. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. All these, all these gifts that he's listed in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So your spiritual gift, it's not a personality trait. It's not an innate ability or talent. It is a supernaturally empowered gift that the Holy Spirit has given you for function and use in his church. So there's this river of power. Here's another river, the river of purity. The river of purity. One distinct aspect and ministry and role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Christian and the life of the church is this sanctifying and purifying work he accomplishes in us as he purifies us to be more like Christ. That is a work of the Spirit. If you'll remember Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, this church that was made up of a lot of former pagans and reprobates. And in chapter 6, he begins to remind them about some of the things they used to do in their old manner of life, all these vile, ugly sins. And he says, such were some of you, and such were some of you. But notice what he says in verse 11. But you were washed, you were 
sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. What does the Holy Spirit do in the life of the Christian and the life of the church? He purifies us. He said something similar to Titus in Titus 3. He said, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. This is the supernatural washing and purifying work of the Spirit. And he does this as he purifies us, as he sanctifies us, he works in us spiritual fruit. We have deeds of our flesh that we act out regularly in our relationships, but when the Spirit purifies us, he produces in us the spiritual fruit. What is it? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, Galatians 5. So there's a river of purity There's a river of power. Here's the third river from the Spirit. I'm calling the river of perception. River of perception. Through the indwelling Holy Spirit, we are given the capacity to perceive things we could not perceive before. We're given the capacity to discern things, to understand things, to have this insight into truth we did not have before. Again, we see this in the Old Testament and the New Testament alike. The Apostle Peter describes what the Old Testament prophets' process was to write Holy Scripture. It wasn't something they just thought of and said, oh, this sounds good. No, how did Peter describe it? He says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Jesus gave this promise, and we'll see this next year in John chapter 16, He says this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. John 16, 13. The spirit gives you discernment as to your identity as a child of God. Look at Romans 8, 16. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Friends, that's having this perception, this discernment, this insight that is supernaturally, spiritually enabled. The fourth river of The spirit I would mention, and there's many more we could talk about, is the river of purpose. See, when the Holy Spirit came down upon the church, as he promised here in John 7, as was accomplished in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, it was not just so that those individuals would somehow get some warm fuzzies. They were given the Holy Spirit for mutual encouragement Growth, love, and purpose, gospel purpose. Notice Acts chapter 2. Again, this is the Pentecost feast. Thousands upon thousands of Jewish, Jewish pilgrims were there in Jerusalem to celebrate. And they asked this question after the Holy Spirit came down. What is this? What's going on? And Peter preaches from Joel chapter 2, and this is a quote from Joel 2. He says, In the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. What does prophesy mean? It means to proclaim to tell forth the truth of the gospel. Friend, here's why, and mark this down, here's why you have the Holy Spirit if you're a Christian. Again, it's not for warm fuzzies or some emotional feeling. You have been given the Holy Spirit to proclaim forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why you have the Spirit of God. Now, we have a variety of gifts within Christ's church, but it was specifically given, again, not to individuals, to a community gathered, All of them, the whole community of faith was given the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is a group project. This is a community event. And these rivers of the Spirit flowing from within are intended to accomplish this purpose of the church. Uh, Again, one more passage, uh, Philippians chapter 2. Paul identifies this purpose specifically. 
Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. And just like the church in Philippi was made up of many members to accomplish one purpose, so too the church in Lookout Valley is made up of many members empowered by the Spirit to accomplish this one unified purpose. It's been this fundamental reality about the unified purpose of Christ through the sending of his Spirit into his church to give us individually unique gifts. It's been this reality that has prompted us months ago to determine that our fall church-wide Bible study was going to be one where we sought to understand the truths connected to this. Uh, I draw your attention to the Next slide on the screen. The name of this study we did, we just ended it. My small group this evening is going to do session five. It's called Finding Your Place. Pastor Wade wrote this curriculum and um, put it together for us. Most of you didn't do all five sessions, right? Most of you didn't. And that's okay. There's no judgment or guilt here. We don't motivate by guilt at Lookout Valley Baptist Church. But I, I would love for all of us to be exposed to this truth that Wade has taken from the scriptures and put forward for us. You'll notice on the back side of your bulletin insert, if you haven't been taking notes, go and take that insert out and turn it over to the back. There's a web address there that we've put together, just lookoutvalley.org slash place. And this is kind of a landing page for this whole study, finding your place. What you'll find there is first the five teaching sessions that Wade did. They're 10 minutes, 11 minutes long each. And then also the full 50 some odd page study guide. You can, if you didn't go through the study, I encourage you to do a self-study or maybe do it with your spouse or someone else, a friend. If you haven't gone through it or if you missed a class, missed a session, go back and catch up on it. Finding your place. And so that's all there. A part of what is connected to this is you see on the outline those QR codes. And also if you go to lookoutvalley.org slash place, there are links to these. There's two online surveys or inventories we would ask you to take, actually three. Uh, The first one is at this website on place ministries. And there we'd ask you to take a disc personality profile. It takes 10, 15 minutes maybe. You've got to sign up for a free account. They won't ask you for your credit card number or anything. Just a login, email, and password. Go take this DISC personality profile. After you complete it, there will be a graph that shows if you're high D or high I or high S or high C or whatever. And then also a spiritual gifts inventory, again, totally free, where it goes through and asks a series of questions to help you try to identify what is the one or two or three spiritual gifts that God may have supernaturally given you. Now, we can all answer the questions the way we would want to answer so we have a particular gift, a personality profile. Answer them honestly. Don't try to game the surveys. But then the last thing we'd ask you to do is if you take both of those surveys, then you record your, your results on that Google form document that is also linked there on the QR code. It's also on that website, lookoutvalley.org slash place. And here's why. Here's why we want 100% participation. Because we believe this can be a great tool in the hands of our pastors, of our elders, of our leadership to say, you know, we have this need over here of ministry at Lookout Valley Baptist Church. We've all been called and gifted by the Holy Spirit for this one purpose, proclaiming the gospel to the world. But there's lots of different responsibilities that that can be lived out. So we have this one need over here of of somebody to serve in this area. And then we have this database of everybody's personality profile and their giftedness. And we can say, hey, you know, this position and this person seems like a match made in heaven. And we can have a conversation. Hey, we have this need. You have this particular proclivity and giftedness and experience and personality. Is this something you would pray about maybe serving in our church? So there's lots of needs in our church that we don't have anybody to plug into. So we're asking for 100% participation so that we can know how the power of the Holy Spirit is manifest in each of our individual lives because, again, it's not for our individual benefit but for the advancement of the kingdom through the purpose of the church to proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth. Not if you're with me. Does that all make sense? Good. So, again, homework. Oh, I didn't know I was going to have homework when I came to church today. Homework. 
Go home. It's, I find it easier to do it on a computer than on or a laptop than on my phone. Some of you do everything on a phone. That's good for you. I can't do it. So if, if you need to do a computer, take these inventories, fill them out, and complete them. Jesus said, when we come to him and we drink deeply, we will have flowing from, the word there in Greek is belly, <laughs> from our innermost seat of our appetites, from within us, we will have rivers of living water flowing out. And this he said to point out that one day he would be sen sending the Spirit. But as I close, I just want to present the Lord's invitation one more time. Look at it again. If anyone thirsts, anyone, you're in anyone. Thirsts, deep need. Let him come to me, not to an idea or philosophy. Come to a person, Jesus, the Son of God, sent from God to live, to die, and to be resurrected. Come to me and do what? Glug, 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 glug. Drink deeply. Find the satisfaction for your soul that only he can give. And that leads to my last thought. Jesus brings complete satisfaction as we drink deeply of him and his spirit activates us for service in his kingdom.